welcome to the green space, which is not the green space again, but my house in upstate New York and various other houses of wonderful people we're going to talk to. And the show is called How to Think Like Bach, which is a slightly presumptuous title. Um, I think it's not that we are going to pretend to be able to think like Bach, but but it's about the idea that Bach is not just teaching us things about music and the art of composition and listening, but he's the, the music tends to teach us in a way how to think through an idea, how to meditate on a, an idea and dialogue with it. I feel like among composers, he's unique in that sense. He engages with the nature of reason itself. And I feel like we could use all the reason we could get right now. Um, so I'm thrilled to have uh, as a guest today, Daniel Levitin, who is probably well known to all of you or many of you. He's a neuroscientist, a cognitive psychologist, a musician, a best-selling author. He is founding Dean of Arts and Humanities at the Minerva Schools at KGI in San Francisco. And he's Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Neuroscience at McGill University. And one of his many books, which I've been rereading over the last couple of weeks, is This Is Your Brain on Music. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm so honored to, to be here and, and to be in a conversation that I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from. <laughs> uh, likewise. Um, maybe I could start by asking you, there, there was a quote that really struck me from, you, from your book, um, which I'll, I'll read here. Um, Perhaps the ultimate illusion in music is the illusion of structure and form. There is nothing in a sequence of notes themselves that creates the rich emotional associations we have with music. Nothing about a scale, a chord, or a chord sequence that intrinsically causes us to expect a resolution. Now that, that makes me feel slightly um, useless in a way um, as a musician. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that and, and, and what's the usefulness of the illusion? Well, quite to the contrary. I think that uh, it's the musician that gives the form and structure, um, certainly the emotional framing um, that makes it meaningful. A robotic interpretation of a piece of music is very unsatisfying. It's like food with no flavor. Do you have a feeling uh, like I do that Bach has some unique, uh, Bach's music has some unique perspective on on the way we think through problems, the way our brain works? Very much so. You know, it was Edgar Varese who said, who defined music as organized sound. Mm -hmm. And I very much like that definition. And for me, um, Bach has always been the supreme organizer of sound <laughs> uh, at, at so many different levels of analysis, at just the minutest micro level and the most expansive macro level, hierarchically. Uh, it's, it's his energy and his caring and his commitment to detail mm -hmm. that is really mind-boggling. Um, let me... Or brain-boggling. Brain-boggling, often finger-boggling in my experience, too. Uh, let me ask you about like a kind of quintessential Bach passage, which is a fugal exposition. And, and I'm, I'm curious what, um, you know, I have my thoughts as a musician, but uh, maybe you have your thoughts as a neuroscientist that, that go with it. Um, I'll play, this is a kind of an elaborate one, but um, the A minor fugue from book one. <laughs> Um, what what do you make of that kind of patterning and that kind of uh, unfolding of music from a from a kind of neuroscientist point of view? Well, it's it's interesting because um, there's a melodic theme that you could probably play with quarter notes or even half notes, but he's added 
um, more rapid notes in between to kind of ornament the theme, right? Right. It Right, basically. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, simple gesture. And then again, basically going over those two notes twice. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it's teaching us about hierarchies and uh, okay. levels of analysis. And for me, that piece is teaching us, and, and Bach is teaching us about repetition and structure. What I think is happening is the brain is ultimately, Jeremy, the brain is a giant pattern detector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. It's also a giant prediction device, and the two go finger in glove. Right. You're detecting patterns so that you can predict what might happen. And at the most basic level, prediction is essential so that you can retreat from a danger or go towards something that might be helpful, like a mate or food, shelter. Yep. And so, what's happening in the brain is that your brain picks up this theme, bump, 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 uh, whatever it is, uh, and then it hears it again, but kind of twisted or moved or positioned differently in time and pitch space. And it makes it, you actually forge a neural connection Right. You build a new connection between those two representations and then another and then another and another. And you're building this elaborate mental network that begins to excite all these different parts of the brain. If you're paying attention. If <laughs> you're paying attention. Wait, while we're on that subject of expectation, as you were talking about, which comes up so often in, in this kind of discussion of music in the brain, you know, expectation and fulfillment. Um, but I have a little, little passage that I, I have a, I've been sort of, obsessing about what to write about, what to say about this place. It's, it's, I, for some reason, I really love this B major prelude. Um, and and um, one of the things that I love about it, um, let me say, is that, that at the very beginning you hear um, this climbing middle voice, D sharp, E, F sharp, and it comes to this A sharp, which is the leading tone, and you still hear it quite dissonantly in a way against the main note, and he never really resolves it. There's a little A sharp and B play there, but it doesn't really, then you're back to the A sharp, come back to the A sharp again against the B. It's still there. And it, instead of going up as you want it to do, it goes down. And we end up on the A sharp again. Yeah? And, and then this, this note comes back again towards the end, for example. And, and we remember. We remember that that's the note we heard before. On, on some deep level, I think we do. And, and it's, it's kind of haunting that piece that, the, first of all, it has a beauty, the dissonance between the notes. It's gorgeous. It's kind of that chord. And at the same time, it's a, it's a kind of problem in the piece, if that makes we, sense. We do remember individual notes. Yeah. Uh, the, as soon as sound waves impinge on the eardrum, they're that starts an electromechanical chain of events. And one of the first things that happen is in the inner ear, right. uh, in the cochlea, you basically, the cochlea is kind of a snail shaped. It's all coiled up. But if you were to flatten it out, you'd have basically a piano keyboard. And the neurons <laughs> are laid out from low wait, to high. Wait, hidden in your ear, there's a little piano keyboard, basically? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have black keys that are raised above the white keys, but it's it's a linear map of pitch space and neurons are tuned to specific pitches. Right. And so um, if you play an A sharp, uh, an A sharp three, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could play that for us. What do you a want? particular cluster of neurons fires to that and only to that. And they pass right. it on up to the brain and they mm -hmm. remember. In fact, if you were to play in a piano that was out of tune long enough, 
Mm -hmm. your neurons would switch their center point to accommodate. Right. So the dissonance is, is interesting from a neurological standpoint. Yeah. It's, I think of it as kind of like the rock in your shoe or the rain on your picnic. And it, as you've said, uh, it teaches us patience uh, that, that it'll resolve. But to me, it, it also teaches us to hope. And, you know, we live in a world governed by the physical law of entropy, which is that everything sooner or later falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But musical dissonance it offers us the hope and the optimism that gets us through the day uh -huh. or through a pandemic mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, this rock in your shoe um, eventually comes out and you're back where you want to be. And, mm -hmm. and, but, you know, we talk about metaphorically in music about coming back home. Right. But it's, 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 it's more nuanced than that, I think. Yeah. Um, it, it's not like uh, you walked out of the house and then you came back and everything's the same. It's like you were away on vacation and you come back to your home and you see it with new eyes. You're in a new emotional place. Right. And I would say that if you end up at the end of a musical piece in exactly the same emotional state you were at the beginning, that piece has failed you. <laughs> I, I would agree. I would agree. Um, you know, I love that image of the rock in your shoe. But the, my, the, my problem with that image or the thing that's interesting about it is I've never really enjoyed having a rock in my shoe, but I really enjoy Bach's dissonances. They're my favorite, in a way, my favorite part. Yeah. And you know, I think I, I, I agree with you. It, it's yeah. uh, not a good analogy. Or no, it's a good analogy picnic. in a certain way. It absolutely is. But it's interesting to inquire about that. Yeah. You know, maybe it's more like this. It's more like the foot massage where they're pressing on the point that hurts. <laughs> yes. But it yeah. kind of hurts in a good way. Can I pick your brain about another, from, from a neuroscientist perspective, another passage, one of the most famous and amazing passages in the well-tempered I'd just love to get your take on it. Um, I'll play a little bit. It would take hours to get through it. Well, not hours, but a long time to get through it. going to stop there. That's only three voices. We haven't even finished what we call the exposition of the fugue yet. Um, My God, I haven't heard that in a while. And that is just genius. The, yeah. Uh, right. the, the first, the opening passage uh, is so unrooted and yeah. seems meandering. And then he fixes it. He puts it in context for you, and suddenly you know where you are. You know exactly where you are. And in the first few bars, you're thinking, is this a mistake? Where is this going? These, these sound dissonant. They're not outlining structures that I've heard before that make sense to me. It's kind of like some of those interesting shots in Breaking Bad where the camera focuses on something that you don't recognize, and it just looks weird. And then as it pulls out in phases, you realize what you're looking at and where you are and you're oriented. And it's just so masterful, this, this auditory equivalent of that. It's a good there's a good reason why he put this last, I think. Um, it's not the most joyful final statement to make in the Weltenberg career, but it's something, you're right, masterful. Um, Hundreds of years ahead of its time. You know, I was thinking before we, we were talking today, I was thinking 
is we were, you were saying how much you wanted to unpack one voice at a time. And, you know, first of all, in the idea itself, in the subject of the few, there's a, there's a simple triad at the beginning, right? Just the B minor, which is going to have a role later in the fugue, which is amazing. But um, and then come the disturbing sighs or, right? And all this disjunct motion, something disorienting, as you say. And then just when you might have given up, here comes another triad, right? To tell you a little bit where you are. But there's something a little bit un unnerving about these reminders of normalcy surrounding this incredible. And then, then when the second voice comes in, in the left hand with the same idea, he puts another voice on top and this is it. And that is just a B minor scale. It's one of the most fundamental But each note that you play is recontextualized by what's happening in the left hand because the ear is drawn towards the low notes. We don't know why that is, but the <laughs> ear is so drawn towards the low notes that they set the harmonic context for everything above them. Sure. And you're playing two notes in the left hand for every one note in the right. True enough, right. Then the third voice is really interesting. We have a little moment of waiting here, which is also so beautiful. These two voices as if they've done something and they don't know what's going to happen next. Just singing against each other, right? Passing back and forth the same idea in a way. And then the third voice comes in in the bass. case boom, 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 boom. now we have again a scale which is kind of the normalizing influence right and then the third voice does something beautiful to make all that more um i guess more beautiful more um expressive give it as But each of those voices has a kind of a meaning, you know? They're not just voices, but one is the subject, which is this, this whole complex of meanings. The middle one is this normalcy of the scale descending, and the other one is this gorgeous um, lyricization of it, if that makes any sense. There's a, an interesting... Uh... I guess lesson or metaphor for getting along with others here in that <laughs> yes. yeah. you know, any of yeah, there's there's one voice that's ostensibly the theme or the centerpiece, but in fact, uh, as as we see in the best parts of our social lives, um, the people in our lives play an equal role to us in our interactions. And so what may seem at first blush to be a supporting voice or a supporting role turns out to be equally as important and equally deserving of being called the primary voice. Right. Any of them can stand on their own. And, uh, you know, as a society, we function best when we support each other and when each of us has an opportunity to shine and display our strengths, but those strengths are always relative to the other people who are around us. And that's what I take from the interaction of the voices there. Let me ask you about this one more little part of this feud, which is so justly famous and also justly feared. All the students hate to play this one because they're worried they're going to get lost, and they probably will. Um, and it deliberately has this lostness baked in. But every so often, you're wandering through this thicket of chromatic doubt and error and all these, all these descents and things. And then suddenly, everything changes. Now, 
then he brings in this arpeggio. He does it again. There's to me almost nothing more heartbreaking than that place. And especially, it would be heartbreaking on its own, but it's especially heartbreaking in combination with the other passages as a foil, you know, as a, as a relief for a kind of island of... Um, and I often think about the way these episodes serve as a kind of relief or a, a mental break from the work of the fuse. I don't know if you have a thought about that, but... I wonder if you could unpack... I mean, the idea that uh, one of the voices is moving in double time to the other. I wonder if, we, wonder if you could play those separately and then together again for us. Yeah, no, of course. Um, you have a held over, in this case, you have held over. Actually, just to be a wonky musician for a second, there's a gorgeous held over C sharp. And right on the downbeat, this held over note. Three notes actually, this cluster together, and then they find this beautiful thing. And what happens is you have a bass. Which is basically doing a sequence, a rising idea that descends, right? And then you have two other voices in interaction. And the other voice. And that's all there is to it. If you unpack it, there's almost nothing in a certain way, right? Yeah. But always a dissonance on the main. I don't know if unpacking it helps people listening out there or, or makes you feel something different. Well, it, it teaches me that uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And, yes. that, you know, again, coming back to society, Bach was a religious man. He believed very much in um, the, the power of people coming together through religion. Uh, we come together in all sorts of ways uh, through uh, you know, interest groups and politics and communities and neighborhoods. And um, each of us has a different voice and different aspirations and hopes. And when we merge them together, we get great institutions like public schools and, and Supreme Courts and uh, you know, things that are imperfect, but that are better than the alternative. I, I like that um, civic vision of these, these voices. Interacting, yeah. You hear each one has a different um, yearning or a different quality to it, right? And then they, then they. Well, I think that that's the power of. Uh, I mean, the psychology of it is that we. I, I'm not a clinical psychologist or a therapist. That's not my end of things. I'm just a simple country neuroscientist working in a lab, but. <laughs> I think the power of, of therapy or meditation or religion is to teach us that our voice may not be the same as other people's voices, and that's fine. Embrace your individuality. As Mr. Rogers said, there's only one you, and you should try to be the best you that you can be. And each of those voices is a you. It's an individual working together to create this beautiful, harmonious community of, of voices in a piece.
And now uh, let me welcome an, a very old friend and musical colleague and one of the great cellists and musicians and chamber musicians of the world, uh, Stephen Israelis. Thank you. Flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> um, we're on this topic of Bach and the brain and, and ways of thinking. Um, I thought I'd ask you, uh, as, a, as an intelligent person, do you feel you have to use your brain differently to play Bach? And how exactly? Not really. I mean, I do think, of course, Bach was an intellectual genius. In all, I mean, he must have been in order to make his music so incredibly satisfyingly intricate at times and all the shapes are perfect and everything. That, that takes intelligence. But I do think that the danger is of thinking of Bach as cerebral, which he certainly is not. I mean, my teacher, Jane Cowan, used to say that Bach was the greatest romantic of them all. And I agree. I mean, if you listen to the Matthew Passion, there's every shade of sadness and tragedy. And it's so moving. It's, it's not that it's sort of mind-blowingly brilliant. You don't think about it as if you're listening. You think about the emotional journey. And I think, you know, of course, Bach, I played the most of the cello suites. And again, it's just the, the sort of the emotional world he takes you through to into. I mean, every suite is a journey, and all six suites actually are a journey, I think, in, them, in the, uh, the whole of them. It's a journey from the prelude of number one to the jig of number six, which is the last moment. Um, and so, you know, his brilliance, you take for granted. It's not the point, somehow. It's, it's engaging with him on an emotional level that I think is, is the most important thing for a musician. And of course, that doesn't by any means sort of argue or contradict the sort of thinking about it. And I think about the suites constantly, even though I don't really perform them anymore. And I'm just thinking about them all the time, but thinking and feeling are the same thing. Music. Right. I, yeah, that's what I, that's the point I would make, I guess, is this distinction between thinking and feeling is kind of a false choice sometimes. And maybe Bach is one of the most interesting composers in terms of erasing that uh, distinction. Um, but there's also, uh, there are places where you feel the sort of the brain on fire sort of inventing things, things that are unprecedented. And then there's times where he's, he seems to be um, calculating this tremendous um, symmetry or scheme or, or plan um, and both of those types of intelligence are there, and they are incredibly, to my ear, thrilling to to experience. I agree. I'd agree with the thrilling bit. And of mm -hmm. course, yes, he's setting himself compositional challenges, puzzles, if you like. But every great composer does that and solves them. You know, I mean, that's what music is. You have this idea, this amazing idea, as you say, the imagination on fire, mm -hmm. what you can do, and then you execute it with, in Bach's case, genius, completely satisfyingly. Yeah. But I never think of his brain sort of ticking without his soul. Yeah. Um, Me so as Debussy said, you know, the form is the emotion in music. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I just find Bach's music so moving in very, very different ways. I mean, he can be so joyous. And I mean, his use of dance expresses it. He can express everything through dance. I mean, even Ebama Diff in the Matthew Passion, which is perhaps the most touching, could be the most it's a silly thing to say, but it could be the most touching piece of music ever written. That's a dance. And he expresses everything with that. And then the fugues are dances also. And yes, the fugues are brilliant, but they're also, I mean, they're brilliant because they're so imaginative, because they take you to all these different worlds. I mean, if you think of the well-tempered clavier, there's not one prelude and fugue that's really like another. He just right. his labyrinth, which you could call emotional, you could call intellectual, whatever. It's a world he takes you through. And about thinking, I mean, it's sort of, I always use the analogy of an actor. You think, why is my character doing this? Why is he saying this? Why is it? And you think and think and think. But that's in order to understand the emotional, the spiritual, whatever you like, journey. It's just identifying with it. I don't feel I've used my brain in a particularly different way in Bach. It's just because it's greater music than virtually anything else. It takes more thought, more emotion. 
Is it is it more treacherous to memorize Bach than other composers? Well, as a cellist, I would say yes. That's why I've sort of pro probably why I've stopped performing the Bach suites in public because I'm so scared of a memory lapse. But I'm not sure it's more treacherous. It's oh. just that there's nothing there <laughs> if you if you forget. You don't have a piano or an orchestra or whatever to cover up for you. And that is, I just find it terrifying to walk on stage by myself. And, um, but I would say probably the well-tempered clavier is much more treacherous to memorize than the suite because because of the fugues. Being so right. We don't have we have an implied fugue in the fifth suite, but um, we don't have any sort of you know, multi-voice fugues. It's I wouldn't say treacherous, but the thought of a memory lapse fills me with dread. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And I find it particularly difficult once you've gotten lost in Bach because of the perfection of it mm -hmm. um, to find your way back. It feels like such a terrible moment. Yeah. Whereas in Chopin or Rachmaninoff or some other composers or even in Mozart, I can sort of improvise to substitute words. But when you start substituting words in Bach, it feels dangerous and bad. Mm. Yeah, you feel you let him down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're... you're as I said, when I played the, the Bach Suites last at the Wigmore Hall in London, I was playing the greatest music I could ever play on the greatest cello with the greatest bow in the greatest hall. The only thing that could go wrong was me. <laughs> the pressure of that. Yeah. So rather than I played one suite at the, at the 92nd Street Y, I played the fifth suite, and I was nervous about that for a year mm -hmm. beforehand. I mean, it's just... You know, you just don't want to let, when you worship music, when you adore it so much, you just don't want to let it down, you want to do it justice. And it's very difficult to do perfection justice. Except even the word perfection, I found a little bit, I mean, it is perfect in that it's perfectly satisfying, but it's sort of not about perfection. I mean, a journey is not about perfection. And as I keep saying, it is a journey. Every piece by him is an emotional journey of some type, of some sort. It's very, very human music. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate you talking to me. Yeah.
what a pleasure it is to welcome to this panel and session on Bach, uh, Dr. Conchetta Tomeno, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function in Mount Vernon, New York. She worked closely with Oliver Sacks for 30 some years or something like that. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure to be here. Real excited to talk to you about this. Um, I guess uh, being a musician, sometimes I feel that music is a therapy and sometimes I feel it's a disease from <laughs> which I suffer. Um, and I'm very, I guess I still have some curiosity what music therapy does, what sorts sure. of applications you have, what you do day to day with your patients. Sure. Well, you know, music therapy and the field of music therapy has been established in the United States since 1950, 1951. And music therapy itself is the clinical and evidence-based applications, use of music interventions to help individuals with specific goals. And so the music therapy is really about this dynamic interpersonal um, intervention that happens between a professional music therapist and a client to address anything from physical, emotional, cognitive, um, or even social needs of the individual. So it has a really broad range of application. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you think about music, you also can see the therapeutic aspects of music in and of itself. So there's the classic field of music therapy, which is an established profession. Mm -hmm. And then there's the uses of music in a more general way to help people with their well-being from day to day. Do you use Bach in, in your clinical work and how and for what particular things? Sure. Well, Bach comes up time and time again, <clears throat> excuse me, because of how universal he is and how well um, people's memories and associations of Bach's music is. So there's the people who know Bach, and then there's the general um, feelings and imagery that comes up with Bach's music that people who even don't know Bach can respond to. So you can think about some of the slow preludes that can help somebody relax, become introspective, um, help them um, with meditation, even even pain reduction. And then you have the, the classic pieces, the hymns that everybody knows um, that they associate with spirituality or general well-being. Is that one of them? Right. So, Yezu Joy. So, it's interesting because I, a lot of my work is with people with memory impairments, people with Alzheimer's disease. And something as simple as, as that tune, that melody, when you play the first couple of notes, yeah. people in, immediately associate the hymn itself mm -hmm. because those memories and those associations are so well and so finely uh, attached to the music that we've been exposed to our whole life. I guess one of the things I'm interested in is is the way, for me, that um, as, a, as a Bach piece proceeds from the beginning to the end, he, he very often concentrates on one idea or, or maybe a pair of ideas, but very often he, he really focuses in the, in the fugues, for example, on a single idea. Let's say... Um, Some, some bit of musical, and then he grabs on and he, he tries to see it then from almost every side, uh, it seems to me. It's like, it's a, he's almost like thinking through a single idea in as many ways as possible. I wonder, does that, does that resonate with you? Do you, um, do you find that it, for people who have trouble, for example, concentrating <laughs> like I do these days, um, is Bach's music particularly useful? But, you know, the, the example that you just gave is a, is a great illustration of how he'll take a theme and then play around with it and, and transform it several times. And I could think of some of my work with people who have attention problems. Um, if they were asked to follow the theme and to hear it and to um, identify the different ways it comes up, again, it really causes them to focus very finely and acutely mm -hmm on the various tones and where they come in. And because box pieces are, are pretty intricate to some degree, it forces their attention for a, a set period of time. And that forced attention is which help, really helps people develop short-term memory and other aspects of, of cognition that could be lacking 
in, in a young child with attention deficit disorder or even an accomplished professional who has trouble focusing. A simple exercise like that can really help them. Um, Since you mentioned attention deficit disorder, there are some pieces of Bach that seem to be at one end or another. It seems to me in the well-tempered figure, there are pieces that represent sort of extreme mental states. And there do seem to be kind of, uh, for example, attention deficit pieces. You know, well, he'll start with one pattern. Repeat it three times. And then he has a different pattern. He takes that for a little while. Do one more time. He goes back to the original pattern, maybe a little bit and changes that. Before long, you're in this complete, something completely different in Adagio with all kinds of rapid um, interventions. And that piece seems to me you know, scattered but brilliant in a way, whereas the fugue that comes afterwards is is quite simple and just repetitive. That idea, and then this idea, which repeats again. And basically the whole fugue is that pair of things, back and forth. And those are two very different kinds of... Um, uh, as I say, mental states, you know, mm -hmm. one which is uh, almost ADD and one which is almost incredibly comforted by simple repetition and alternation. I wonder if you have any reactions to that. Well, it, it makes me think about how, how creative and um, intricate Bach was in his compositions. I mean, he's actually thinking through issues in real time in, in his music, right? He's taking ideas and he's analyzing them and he's thinking about all the different ways that he can express that idea and then maybe he comes to some resolution in in providing a way for other people to appreciate that theme in a simpler way. I like the idea that we were talking about that yesterday a little bit too, I think, of the sort of real time, you know, the in the piece as it unfolds, you hear the thought happening. Um, mm -hmm. That can happen in, in Beethoven too and other classical composers to some extent. But I'm not sure in any composer as much as you, you hear it as much as you do with with Bach. But I, yeah. And I, and, I, and I think one of the things that uh, reasons why Bach seems to be so universal is the type of patterns and the repetitions happen, not that they're predictable, but they happen in a more predictable way. Mm -hmm. They um, hold people's attention. It doesn't distract. It actually engages, which is very important too. Just to follow on a thread about people who who have an obsessive thought and can't find resolution and that that's the danger is not being able to produce anything out of the obsession. Right. Right. We were talking about how um, using Bach as an example of how this kind of rumination that happens, people who get stuck, people who can't move forward usually have racing thoughts. They keep focusing on one particular thing and can't get past that. Right. And sometimes the way to get past it is to, re you have to resolve what those issues are, right? Yeah. And so playing around with those different themes, finding out what's the most important, focusing on the most important, allows you to come to some resolution. It's you know, um, sort of cognitive behavioral therapy type thing mm -hmm. in the form of Bach and, and, and music. Um, but that's so exactly what somebody needs to do to be able to move forward. You know, what's so great about that for me is that we use that word, of course, resolution, in the business, in the music business. <laughs> um, that's an incredibly important word for our sense of, you know, when a, a musical phrase is waiting to resolve. And, and Bach is a great master of extending out the need to resolve and making you wait for a very long time for these amazing resolutions. Um, and and every, every, you know, leading tone has to resolve to its main tone. And, and the fact that you use that word in, in in a therapeutic and clinical context is really interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so crucial. I mean, any, any um, healing and health is about resolving issues or resolving problems um, that allows you to go on with your life and to go on with your health in a very positive way. Um, it's just interesting that music does the same thing inherently. Connie, thank you so much for talking with me today. Oh, it was a pleasure. This is fun. We could go on forever and ever, I think. Yeah, we, I'm sure we could.
Welcome to Emmy Ferguson, a wonderful young flutist, uh, and she has a very fun album called Fly the Coop of Bach music for flute and various instruments. Um, she's here to talk with us about Bach and the Brain also. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Jeremy. Of course. Um, do you feel that Bach makes you think differently than other composers do? I think Bach challenges all of us in incredibly creative ways, um, always forcing us to channel different parts of our brains, no matter when we're approaching it. It's always sort of a new experience. And for me right now, and I think for a lot of musicians, um, we're all turning to Bach during this, this time. Um, it has an amazing way of resonating with so many different people uh, across the country, across the world. And it's really fascinating to think about how Bach may have responded to these particular situations we find ourselves in today. And that kept question keeps, you know, having me really think about, you know, what is it in his music that sort of allows us to, to access different parts of our brain. And I think a lot of it is that he really dealt with constraints in a fascinating way. He put constraints on himself in order to write quickly um, and with great purpose. And I think that for us right now is something that so many of us are struggling with is finding what the purpose is in our day-to-day -day music making. And so sort of looking back at how Bach applied that in his own life, um, given the fact that he was incredibly busy, he had a lot of children, a lot of teaching responsibilities, composing responsibilities. So by being able to sort of uh, direct his focus and attention, he was able to produce just these incredible output of music that is able to serve as beautiful, um, robust blank slates for every person now as we interpret them. Mm -hmm. I like that business of the constraints and the, that's often composers say that, you know, you need some constraints in order to create freedom in a way, in order to find your freedom. And there's a, there's a lot of ways that, you know, Bach is operating within a, a language of sort of what we call voice leading and counterpoint, you know, where Many things are possible, but many a much more a much larger number of things are impossible. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's the rules, right? And it's somehow in the process of working within the rules that Bach manages to find his most amazing inspirations and know. breaking the rules as well. That's what's so them, fun. Yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but finding creative ways um, around the rules that that are. I think the things that bring us all back to his music because it continues to surprise us um, in its beauty, but also when you look deep down into the harmony and the counterpoint, it's like, oh, fascinating. He decided to go there. You know, yeah. okay. The element of surprise is, keeps coming up um, with, with uh, Dan Levitin, the neuro neuroscientist, and this element of expectation and surprise and this combination of rule following and rule bending. I wouldn't say breaking, but bending. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Yeah. Um, is there a piece of yours, uh, the piece of box that you feel is it special, takes your brain, your whether, whether you're thinking or feeling to an unusual place? I'm always, with all of the pieces that he wrote for the flute, so he wrote six flute sonatas, and they're all incredibly different and beautiful, and they all pose um, very unique challenges when you're approaching them, because when you look at them at face value, they don't really seem to fit the instrument um, in a friendly way. But you st as you start to get to know them, uh, and you sort of really try to think through his lens, you're able to start to see that he's composing not only for the instrument, but also for the future of the instrument as well as the present. The colors that the instrument he had access to um, when he wrote in bizarre keys, there's one in E major, which is a nasty, nasty key on the Baroque flute, um, but it allows so, like an unboxing of colors and worlds. Um, and when you put that on a modern flute, the facility that you have with all these extra keys is unbelievable. So for me, it's really fun to think about uh, the forward thought of, of what he was doing. He was writing incredible music that has so much craft um, in the foundation of it that is able to withstand so many changes and iterations in the instruments, in the places it was performed, and also how people perform it. Uh, you see so many people today doing various different um, other genre takes on Bach or uh, arranging, adding. It's, it's amazing that it's so structurally sound that it's able to um, withstand all of that. 
Well, thank you so much for talking with me about Bach. And, of course. And thank you. My pleasure, and can't wait to hear. I'd like to welcome back author and neuroscientist and brilliant guy, Dan Levitin. Let me ask you about um, one other thing, or maybe a few more, but I, the one that's occurring to me right now is um, I was reading, I was cramming in your book this morning some more fascinating information, and I came across this little bit about mirror neurons. And, and Bach often uses mirrors you know, reflections in his music. There's a, one of my favorite examples is in the, the C minor violin sonata. Um, there's a slow movement that begins. And the first thing he does is echo it, yeah? Quieter. And then he does the most amazing thing. He does it in upside down. And, and this feeling that he has echoed it and then inverted it, and he's hearing reflections off the main idea in every possible way, um, is one of my fascinations about Bach. What's the power of that? And I don't know if it probably doesn't connect in any intelligent way to your mirror neurons, but it seemed to me very powerful connection in my own brain anyway. Well, I agree with you. Uh, you know, mirrors, think back to when you were a kid and you first saw a mirror, uh, you know, and, and understood what was going on and, and you play around with it, right? You move and see if the image moves with you and you turn. And of course it's you, but it's an inverted you because that person's right is your left. Mm -hmm. You know, you're touching your right cheek in the mirror, but if you were in the mirror looking out, it would be that person's left cheek. It's, it's kind of weird. And then when I was a kid anyway, we'd go to the fun house and there'd be mirrors that made you look fat or thin or upside down. And it was endlessly fascinating because 
it's a way that children learn to uh, structure the world, to learn that uh, I can take a pen and I can turn it this way and it's still a pen and I can move it around and uh, a fat pen is still a pen. It's These are fundamental things about the nature of the physical world that we learn as children and that Bach is playing with. The connection to mirror neurons is that uh, these are the monkey see, monkey do near neurons. Mm -hmm. um, they were discovered by Rizzolatti and his team in Italy. Um, they had monkeys connected to wires that were measuring brain activity. Um, they wanted to see which part of the monkey's brain was used when it peeled a banana and ate the banana. You know, they're tracking the motor system, the motor control right. system. They have another monkey who's still wired up, who hasn't yet had his turn. Mm -hmm. And he's watching the, the first monkey peel and eat the banana. And this other monkey who's not doing anything except watching has activity in the same brain regions right. as the one who's actually doing the actions. Right. And uh, Rizzolatti called the mirror neurons because he, the, the stationary non-moving monkey is mirroring the activity, effectively predicting with his brain what he would have to do in order to make those movements and eat a banana. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea that Bach is mirroring in time and in pitch space the various things uh, that he's doing, that probably doesn't activate the so-called mirror neurons, but to some extent, uh, even if you're not a musician, that part of your brain is trying to figure out what gestures would I have to make to create those sounds. And if you're a musician, I mean, as you know, uh, um, you listen to another pianist and you can't help but picture in your mind what their fingers are doing and their feet are doing. And sure. That's the mirror neuron system. There's the, the, in the very first piece we were talking about, the A minor fugue, you know, after he gets done doing the four voices, the right side up, he does them all again now, upside down. Um, we remember climbing with. So the next thing that happens is upside down. Here it comes again, upside down. But as it, as in this example, turning it upside down has an unusual uh, side effect. It doesn't work exactly the same way upside down as it did in music, the way that it did right side up. And so it often ends up, you know, he starts in a sort of pleasant C major. But to make it work, he has to modulate in the middle and when... So the act of mirroring causes all, some all kinds of consequences. And that's true in many places. In the B major fugue, there's a beautiful... Um, right? And then when it comes upside down, it changes the whole feeling. Because what was the, the trough before becomes the peak and the whole timing and gesture of the thing changes and feels like a little bit of a revelation um but yeah well you know going up a hill it feels different than going down a hill and going up a scale feels different than going down it and um it, it recontextualizes the gesture and the um the phrase the I, i'm keep going back to little kids uh and yeah because yeah. there's a playfulness to bach a childlike playfulness often is yeah and, you know, as kids, we used to love standing on our heads and seeing the world upside down. Right. And um, that... I'm not, was, I'm not as into it now at, at almost 50 years old for some reason. Yeah. Well, your, your body weighs more and it's putting a lot of pressure on your head. <laughs> yes, I suppose that's true. It's, that's it's, a good I think it's largely that. Um, and it's, it's, we're not as limber, uh, but... Um, certainly there are, you know, gymnasts and acrobats and circus performers spend a lot of time upside down and, uh, and Bach is metaphorically spending a lot of time upside down, just allowing us to see the world in a different way. Um, and ultimately, I think that's the, the job of art to cause us to see the world with new eyes, new ears, to, um, to see that the obvious interpretation or the go-to interpretation is just a small fraction 
of what's really out there in the world. It's all, it's all about teaching the brain to learn something new to, because ultimately your success as an organism depends on your ability to learn new things, learn new sources of food, learn new uh, ways of protecting yourself from hazards. Um, and that applies to all mammals, uh, birds, fish, this learning is, a, is fundamental. Mm-hmm. And, and Bach makes the learning salient and fun. Let me, let me ask you about, uh, you were saying in your book that there's some connection between the sort of expectation fulfillment element of music and the sort of dopamine uh, pleasure system. Uh, can you speak about that at all? Because I, I, sometimes I do feel addicted to music in, a, in good and bad ways. Well, so uh, there's a caveat here, which is that there are about a hundred different neurochemicals, and we are really only have the tools to measure about five of them. Uh, and so those five are getting a lot of credit for stuff that's much more nuanced. Uh, and of course, when the level of one neurochemical goes up, it stimulates a very uh, um, complex choreography of other chemical levels going up and down and changing. And so um, dopamine uh, is, is been found to be uh, active in pleasure and in reward and in being able to make predictions and learn new things. There's a well-known reward system that um, when you experience pleasure, like eating chocolate, or uh, if you're a gambler and you win a bet, or you're an addict and you get your drug of choice, you have sex, you listen to music, this reward circuit kicks in. And among other things, it gives you a little squirt of dopamine. Right. Uh, And um, dopamine can be addictive. It's why people are checking their cell phones compulsively. Uh, Each new thing that comes in, each new thumbs up on Facebook or what have you, is just a tiny little bit of reward. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there was an experiment done at McGill in the 50s Uh, McGill University in Montreal, where rats were um, hooked up in such a way that if they pressed a bar in their cage, they'd get dopamine, you know, internally generated dopamine in their brains. And they were allowed to eat and drink and mate. But once they discovered the bar, they pressed the bar over and over and over again until they died. Mm -hmm. Right. And if that reminds you of somebody compulsively checking their email over and over again. I feel a distinction between the pleasures of music and that kind of website refresh the pleasure. Um, and I wish I could put my finger on, on what it is, but it is one of the things that gives me faith about music as a, as a profession and a life work, you know, it feels more lasting than that. Um, well, it's because um, there are more neurochemicals involved than right. uh, than just that and just that loop. And of course, you know, we maybe music pleasure is more like um, food pleasure, desserts. Uh. <laughs> this is so interesting because you, you, this word expectation and fulfillment comes up a lot when people are explaining the effect of music. And, and I have to say at some point I'm like, yes, but then, but then what, right? There's all kinds of expectation. You know, there's the expectation of opening your presents at Christmas, the expectation of seeing someone you are haven't seen in a long time there's this expectation of this delicious dessert that you just made um but that you know what i mean it's it once you've got the expectation it doesn't seem to totally capture the things that i love about music but maybe i'm just being a romantic about myself not at all I, you you've gotten to what i think is the most interesting part of all this Mm -hmm. Uh, the way that musical pleasure differs chemically. Um, We distinguish uh, in neuroscience between two kinds of pleasure, anticipatory pleasure or expectation driven and consummatory pleasure, the actual consuming. So (laughs) anticipating that dessert, um, anticipating an orgasm, that's different than having the dessert or having the orgasm. And they're served by different neurochemical systems. The dopaminergic system is the expectation. Mm-hmm. You have opioids in your brain, just like heroin. I mean, right. 
they're not toxic, but you've got endogenous internal opioids that are released when you consume a pleasure. So looking at the cake, dopamine, eating the cake, opioids. The thing about music that's unique among pleasures yeah. is that it binds the two together um, inextricably so that the anticipate you, you anticipate something, you get a little bit of, con you're consuming it, but then there's more anticipation and more consumption and they're happening at the same time. Uh, the music is constantly setting up an expectation that's either rewarded or thwarted and it, it unfolds across time in a way that both are going on at the same time. Yeah. That, that feels like it gets closer, yeah, to my, you know, instinctive sense of what's happening. What, and I don't, there's no evidence that music is addictive in the way that heroin or gambling are, or, <laughs> no. or internet addiction. There's no evidence at all. I mean, every once in a while you hear about somebody who sold everything that they owned and joined, you know, uh, uh, you know made their life following jam bands like Fish or the Grateful Dead. But that's probably not music addiction fueled so much as LSD fueled. It's a different thing. Well, there's that famous David Foster Wallace saying something, something is malignantly addictive when it proposes itself as the solution to the very problems it causes. <laughs> right. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think music is like that. You're right. It, it, it's circular, but in a different way. And then I, I like that constant, um, interplay of the two kinds of pleasure that that makes sense you know that one one last thing and i know we're we have no time left but um from your book i remember you talking about how musical experience engages parts of the brain that are relatively new evolutionarily speaking and parts that are quite old and primitive or whatever primal can you speak about that just a little bit so um in mammalian brain evolution, actually going back to all land-based organisms, we start out with uh, a brain that's very simple. Uh, it reacts to light and dark and hunger and thirst uh, in order to sustain itself. We, uh, it, it has fear, and we call this the reptilian brain. And then throughout hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, new areas of the brain were added on top and in an expanding way. So what we call cortex actually comes from the Greek word for bark. It's like the bark on a tree, where the tree is the reptilian brain and the bark keeps growing out. The studies that we've done in my lab show that music activates some of the oldest regions of the brain, mm -hmm. uh, reptilian regions, and it accesses them directly and instantly but it also accesses these higher cortical structures that are unique to humans, the ones that have to do with um, more nuanced and hierarchical predictions in the prefrontal cortex. It accesses memory. Uh, we humans have exquisite memory, multi-sensory memory, and when you're listening to a piece of music, it invokes music you've heard before, who you were with when you heard it before, um, and a lot of, and it, it also activates categorization systems, which are fairly advanced in humans. Uh, I can hear that. And even if I've never heard it before, I know it's Bach and not Shostakovich, right. uh, or I know that it's classical and not rap. I know that it's piano and not bassoon. Um, it's, these categorization, it's all happening at once. Uh, old systems, new systems. And the old systems seem to be even more ancient than the systems for language. So, um, Dan, you're also, on top of being a neuroscientist, a pianist. I don't know that I'm a pianist, but I'm a musician uh, who plays the piano, and I've been playing it since I was four. And um, it's taken back seat in the last few years to my research career. But I, during the lockdown, I've become reacquainted with the piano. And there are pieces that I used to play that are beyond me now, and I could resurrect them. But what I'm playing is the Chopin prelude in E minor and, and the Trois Genapides by Satie, because it's so easy to get my, I've been able to get my fingers 
on all the notes for well over 50 years, the fingerings are not a problem, but turning them into music is the challenge. And, and I think I could spend the rest of my life with all the little micro adjustments that go on with different pressure in each finger, micro pressure differences and yeah. micro timing differences and getting the, the right emphasis. And I mean, the pedaling, that's a whole other world. As a, a part-time pianist, I find it immensely rewarding because I'm not struggling with trying to make my fingers do things that um, would take me a thousand hours to get them to do. Right. That part is taken care of. I'm exploring the emotion of the piece, and I find that tremendously rewarding. Yeah, and, and my and as you said um, quite accurately, my piano teacher's pianist's answer to some of that is is as you say, tiny variations and alterations in color, timbre, timing. One note that lasts a little bit longer than the other. You know, the, in the Chopin you're talking about, I'm sure everyone knows. I mean, everything is about, first of all, how you voice the chords in the left hand, the heartbeat of the left hand. The rubato, uh, you, you the can't rubato, play it like Bach. Yeah. Play, play it like Bach for a minute. Well, it wouldn't work, it doesn't even speak in that language. Right, right. It completely falls apart. It doesn't work. It completely falls apart, and that's the point of it for me, is that uh, if, you, if you don't play it right, it's just notes. It's finding the music in those notes that's a lifelong challenge. Um, well, it's speaking in a different dialect than Bach, obviously. But some of the same, it's interesting, there are some of the same things happening. Oh, uh, clearly Chopin had studied Bach, yes. Yeah, and, and it's this, both of these pieces, I'm thinking of another Bach prelude from the Well-Tempered, that that they're both about kind of um, rumination, um, a deep sorrow, obviously, yeah, and and this the very act of ruminating on something, and and in both cases, you know, this Chopin is obsessively about this pair of notes, right? Yeah, right. And he recontextualizes them over yeah, and over each again, time, repeating the same two notes, hearing them in different harmonies. Um, and then you have this pulsating left hand, which it goes against. It. And, and in this famous, another one of the greatest hits that I didn't get to in the Waltemberg Clavier, this. Um, Simpler three notes, be da di di di. Three pitches, five notes. The repetition of the third pitch. It's the same. The same element is you have a repeated note in which the harmony changes on the last of them, right? One harmony, another harmony, against which it conflicts. It's always. And it's the same idea. Repeated, and there's like in the Chopin also. There's this um, thread of heartbeat or whatever it is that indicates some, um, um, I guess, ongoing process of, of, you know, haunting ongoingness behind the hesitation of the idea or something like that. The piece I was working on this morning before we uh, connected was uh, the um, uh, Beethoven. Uh, Moonlight Sonata, which has a similar kind of recontextualization of a recontextualization of a repeating pattern, so, and this one. You mean that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Similarly, a great expression of sorrow and a kind of a rumination, right? You feel like it's the kind of thing you would play while you're deep in contemplation of some tragedy, past or present. Well, and he moves into it with just that lone uh, broken chord, the arpeggio in, arpeggio in the left hand. 
Yeah, Beethoven actually, I think, stole the Moonlight Sonata from a famous scene in Don Giovanni, the first, right after Don Giovanni stabs the commendatore. Everyone sits around and contemplates what's just happened. There's very much an obsessive quality to Bach, an OCD quality uh, and rumination, as you say. It's, it's as though uh, he's got an idea and he's thinking about it in every possible way. He's exploring every corner and crevice of the idea to the extreme, as though he's he's on drugs, and you know it just Hopefully he wasn't, yeah, right. But I mean, it's just it's an obsessive. If it's it's something that we most of us try to keep ourselves from doing because it just seems exhausting or abnormal. But he does it for us, yeah. and he brings it around and ties a bow on it, and it's very very rewarding. And of course, that kind of, uh, kind of obsessiveness to detail is what has led to things like the, the polio vaccine and, you know, I mean, great, you know, the discovery of the structure of DNA and um, you know, look at the pointillist artist, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's a mind boggling exploration of minute detail in the service of a larger idea. Um, I mean, even the constitution the people who drew that up, you know, uh, spent so many thousands of human hours on it, obsessing over every detail. And that's why it's, it's lasted so long. Thanks, Dan, so much for doing this. That Thank you, Jeremy. Fun. What a treat for me. Thank you.
thank you all so much for watching uh, this third episode of the well-tempered lens the green space thanks to the people of the green space um and uh, also just to say thank you for putting up with my poor piano which needs a lot of, a lot of love we tried to make music on it and i'm so grateful to all my special guests this week talking about bach in the brain and how to think through bach or how bach thinks um dr daniel levitin dr connie tamino Amy Ferguson, wonderful flutist, and of course, the great cellist, Stephen Isolis. Thank you to everyone for being a part of it.